The European Commission is the executive body of the European Union responsible for proposing legislation, implementing decisions, upholding the EU treaties and managing the day-to-day -day business of the EU. Commissioners swear an oath at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, pledging to respect the treaties and to be completely independent in carrying out their duties during their mandate. The Commission operates as a cabinet government, with 28 members of the Commission. There is one member per member state, though members are bound to represent the interests of the EU as a whole rather than their home state. One of the 28 is the Commission President proposed by the European Council and elected by the European Parliament. The Council then appoints the other 27 members of the Commission in agreement with the nominated President and the 28 members as a single body are then subject to a vote of approval by the European Parliament. The current commission is the Juncker Commission, which took office in late 2014. The term commission is used either in the narrow sense of the 28-member College of Commissioners or to also include the administrative body of about 23,000 European civil servants who are split into departments called Directorates General and Services. The procedural languages of the Commission of English, French and German. The members of the Commission and their cabinets are based in the Berlaymont Building in Brussels. History The European Commission derives from one of the five key institutions created in the supranational European community system. Following the proposal of Robert Schuman, French Foreign Minister, on 9 May 1950, originating in 1951 as the high authority in the European coal and steel community. The Commission has undergone numerous changes in power and composition under various presidents, involving three communities. Establishment The first Commission originated in 1951 as the nine-member high authority under President John Monnet. The High Authority was the supranational administrative executive of the new European coal and steel community. It took office first on 10 August 1952 in Luxembourg. In 1958 the Treaties of Rome had established two new communities alongside the ECSC, the European Economic Community and the European Atomic Energy Community. However their executives were called commissions, rather than high authorities. The reason for the change in name was the new relationship between the executives and the council. Some states, such as France, expressed reservations over the power of the high authority and wished to limit it giving more power to the council rather than the new executives. Louis Armand led the first commission of Eurotom. Walter Halstein led the first commission of the EEC, holding the first formal meeting on 16 January 1958 at the Chateau of Val Duchessa. It achieved agreement on a contentious serial price accord as well as making a positive impression upon third countries when it made its International debut at the Kennedy Round of General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade Negotiations. Halstein notably began the consolidation of European law and started to have a notable impact on national legislation. Little heed was taken of his administration at first bit, with help from the European Court of Justice. His commission stamped its authority solidly enough to allow future commissions to be taken more seriously. However, in 1965 accumulating differences between the French government of Charles de Gaulle and the other member states triggered the empty chair crisis, ostensibly over proposals for the common agricultural policy. Although the institutional crisis was solved the following year, it cost Etienne Hirsch his presidency of Eurotom and later Walter Halstein the EEC presidency despite otherwise being viewed as the most dynamic leader until Jacques Delors. Early development The three bodies, collectively named the European Executives, coexisted until 1 July 1967 when, under the Merger Treaty, they were combined into a single administration under President John Ray. Due to the merger the Ray Commission saw a temporary increase to 14 members, although subsequent commissions were reduced back down to nine. Following the formula of one member for small states and two for larger states, 
The Ray Commission completed the community's customs union in 1968 and campaigned for a more powerful, elected, European Parliament. Despite Ray being the first president of the combined communities, Halstein is seen as the first president of the modern commission. The Malfatti and Mansolt commissions followed with work on monetary cooperation and the first enlargement to the North in 1973. With that enlargement the commission's membership increased to 13 under the Autoly Commission, which dealt with the enlarged community during economic and international instability at that time. The external representation of the community took a step forward when President Roy Jenkins recruited to the presidency in January 1977 from his role as Home Secretary of the United Kingdom's Labour government, became the first president to attend a G8 summit on behalf of the community. Following the Jenkins Commission, Gaston Thorne's commission oversaw the community's enlargement to the south. In addition to beginning work on the Single European Act, Jacques Delors The commission headed by Jacques Delors was seen as giving the community a sense of direction and dynamism. Delors and his team are also considered as the founding fathers of the Euro. The International Herald Tribune noted the work of Delors at the end of his second term in 1992. Mr. Delors rescued the European community from the doldrums. He arrived when Euro-pessimism was at its worst. Although he was a little-known former French finance minister, he breathed life and hope into the EC and into the dispirited Brussels Commission. In his first term, from 1985 to 1988, he rallied Europe to the call of the single market, and when appointed to a second term he began urging Europeans toward the far more ambitious goals of economic Monetary and political union, Jacques Santa the successor to Delors was Jacques Santa. The entire Santa Commission was forced to resign in 1999 by the Parliament as a result of a fraud and corruption scandal, with a central role played by Edith Cresson. These frauds were revealed by an internal auditor Paul Van Butenen. That was the first time a commission had been forced to resign en masse and represented a shift of power towards the Parliament. However the Santa Commission did carry out work on the Amsterdam Treaty and the Euro. In response to the scandal the European Anti-Fraud Office was created. Romano Prada following Santa, Romano Prada took office. The Amsterdam Treaty had increased the Commission's powers and Prada was dubbed by the press as something akin to a Prime Minister. Powers were strengthened again with the Nice Treaty in 2001 giving the Presidents more power over the composition of their commissions. Jose Manuel Barroso In 2004 Jose Manuel Barroso became President. The Parliament once again asserted itself in objecting to the proposed membership of the Barroso Commission. Due to the opposition Barroso was forced to reshuffle his team before taking office. The Barroso Commission was also the first full commission since the enlargement in 2004 to 25 members and hence the number of commissioners at the end of the Prada Commission had reached 30. As a result of the increase in the number of states, the Amsterdam Treaty triggered a reduction in the number of commissioners to one per state, rather than two for the larger states. Allegations of fraud and corruption were again raised in 2004 by former chief auditor Jules Muis. A commission officer Guido Strack reported alleged fraud and abuses in his department in years 2002 to 2004 to Olaf and was fired as a result. In 2008 Paul Van Butenen accused the European Anti-Fraud Office of a lack of independence and effectiveness. Barrazzo's first commission term expired on 31 October 2009, under the Treaty of Nice. The first commission to be appointed after the number of member states reached 27 would have to be reduced to less than the number of member states. The exact number of commissioners was to be decided by a unanimous vote of the European Council and membership would rotate equally between member states. 
Following the accession of Romania and Bulgaria in January 2007, this clause took effect for the next commission. The Treaty of Lisbon, which came into force on 1 December 2009, mandated a reduction of the number of commissioners to two-thirds of member states from 2014 unless the Council decided otherwise. Membership would rotate equally and no member state would have more than one commissioner. However, the treaty was rejected by voters in Ireland in 2008 with one main concern being the loss of their commissioner. Hence a guarantee given for a rerun of the vote was that the council would use its power to amend the number of commissioners upwards. However, according to the treaties it still has to be fewer than the total number of members. Thus it was proposed that the member state that does not get her commissioner would get the post of high representative, the so-called 26 plus 1 formula. This guarantee contributed to the Irish approving the treaty in a second referendum in 2009. Lisbon also combined the posts of European Commissioner for External Relations with the Council's High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy. This post, also a Vice President of the Commission, would chair the Council of the European Union's Foreign Affairs meetings as well as the Commission's External Relations duties. The treaty further provides that the most recent European elections should be taken into account when appointing the Commission. Although the President is still proposed by the European Council, the European Parliament elects the Commission rather than approves it as under the Treaty of Nice. Jean-Claude Juncker In 2014, Jean-Claude Juncker became President of the European Commission. Powers and Functions the Commission was set up from the start to act as an independent supranational authority separate from governments. It has been described as the only body paid to think European. The members are proposed by their member state governments, one from each. However, they are bound to act independently, neutral from other influences such as those governments which appointed them. This is in contrast to the Council, which represents governments, the Parliament, which represents citizens, the Economic and Social Committee, which represents organized civil society, and the Committee of the Regions, which represents local and regional authorities. Through Article 17 of the Treaty on European Union the Commission has several responsibilities to develop medium-term strategies, to draft legislation and arbitrate in the legislative process, to represent the EU in trade negotiations, to make rules and regulations. The rules of procedure of the European Commission set out the Commission's operation and organization. Executive power before the Treaty of Lisbon came into force. The executive power of the EU was held by the Council. It conferred on the Commission such powers for it to exercise. However, the Council was theoretically allowed to withdraw these powers, exercise them directly, or impose conditions on their use. This aspect has been changed by the Treaty of Lisbon, after which the Commission exercises its powers just by virtue of the treaties. Powers are more restricted than most national executives, in part due to the Commission's lack of power over areas like foreign policy. That power is held by the European Council, which some analysts have described as another executive. Considering that under the Lisbon Treaty the European Council has become a formal institution with the power of appointing the Commission, it could be said that the two bodies hold the executive power of the EU. However, it is the Commission that currently holds executive powers over the European Union. The governmental powers of the Commission have been such that some such as former Belgian Prime Minister Guy de Hofstadt have suggested changing its name to the European Government, calling the present name of the Commission ridiculous. Legislative initiative The Commission differs from the other institutions in that it alone has legislative initiative in the EU. Only the Commission can make formal proposals for legislation. They cannot originate in the legislative branches. Under the Treaty of Lisbon, no legislative act is allowed in the field of the common foreign and security policy. In the other fields, the Council and Parliament are able to request legislation. In most cases, the Commission initiates the basis of these proposals. 
This monopoly is designed to ensure coordinated and coherent drafting of EU law. This monopoly has been challenged by some who claim the Parliament should also have the right, with most national parliaments holding the right in some respects. However, the Council and Parliament may request the Commission to draft legislation, though the Commission does have the power to refuse to do so as it did in 2008 over transnational collective conventions. Under the Lisbon Treaty, EU citizens are also able to request the Commission to legislate in an area via a petition carrying one million signatures. But this is not binding. The Commission's powers in proposing law have usually centered on economic regulation. It has put forward a large number of regulations based on a precautionary principle. This means that preemptive regulation takes place if there is a credible hazard to the environment or human health, for example on tackling climate change and restricting genetically modified organisms. This is opposed to waiting regulations for their effect on the economy. Thus, the Commission often proposes stricter legislation than other countries. Due to the size of the European market this has made EU legislation an important influence in the global market. Recently the Commission has moved into creating European criminal law. In 2006, a toxic waste spill off the coast of Côte d'Ivoire from a European ship prompted the Commission to look into legislation against toxic waste. Some EU states at that time did not even have a crime against shipping toxic waste leading to the commissioners Franco Frattini and Stavros Dimis to put forward the idea of ecological crimes. Their right to propose criminal law was challenged in the European Court of Justice but upheld. As of 2007, the only other criminal law proposals which have been brought forward are on the Intellectual Property Rights Directive, and on an amendment to the 2002 Counter-Terrorism Framework decision, outlawing terrorism-related incitement, recruitment and training. Enforcement Once legislation is passed by the Council and Parliament, it is the Commission's responsibility to ensure it is implemented. It does this through the member states or through its agencies. In adopting the necessary technical measures, the Commission is assisted by committees are made up of representatives of member states and of the public and private lobbies. Furthermore, the Commission is responsible for the implementation of the EU budget, ensuring, along with the Court of Auditors, that EU funds are correctly spent. In particular the Commission has a duty to ensure the treaties and law are upheld, potentially by taking member states or other institutions to the Court of Justice in a dispute. In this role it is known informally as the guardian of the treaties. Finally, the Commission provides some external representation for the Union, alongside the member states and the common foreign and security policy, representing the Union in bodies such as the World Trade Organization. It is also usual for the President to attend meetings of the G8.